Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Shots Fired Podcast. I'm Mark Redlich. And I'm Kyle Schobergen. Today, we have an awesome interview for you guys. We've got the sheriff from Pinal County, Sheriff Mark Lamb, and yes, his chief deputy, Matthew Thomas, in studio with us. We are super excited for this one, guys. Thank you very much for uh, making the trip out here to do this with us. We're excited. I think we're more excited. I know I sound like a boy going through puberty right now. <laughs> I was going to say. Voice, but I'm still here. Yeah, what's going on with that? So, <laughs> hey, we want to get the show started. But before we do that, we want to thank our sponsor for today's episode, TAC Ops. Make sure you guys jump over to the website, SWATConference.org. Get registered for the three conferences they have coming up. Mark and I will be at each yep, conference. Yep, all three of them. Uh, teaching some classes there. We're bringing the podcast to you guys live. Uh, so that should be a good time. So go check it out. Um, you ready to get it going? Yep. Let's do it. Cool. Sheriff, Matt, thank you guys for uh, coming on the show. This yeah. is awesome. This is a real treat for us. We're excited. Uh, we have a lot to dive into. We're going to, I mean, we can sit here and talk all day, but I think we're going to focus a lot of this episode on leadership within a you know police organization or any business organization you guys are obviously a very successful, high-functioning team at your department. Uh, so we want to break into your guys' minds and uh, crack that code. True. So be careful there. Bro. <laughs> you don't want, you're not going to like what you see. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let's uh, start out. Can you guys uh, give us a bio of each of yourselves and you know what, how you guys progress through your career? Uh, so, yeah, I'll start then. Uh, so started the career in 1993 as a 20-year-old and uh, started with Pinal County and started in our jail first, worked there. And that was kind of the thing back then, right? You started in the jail, did a little bit of time working in there. And then if you wanted to go out to the road as a deputy, you would. So I went out to the road, uh, became a deputy and uh, worked patrol in, stayed in patrol for a few years and then went off to traffic. And back then our traffic unit did like traffic. So fatals, DUIs, uh, but we were also involved in drug interdiction and some of the gang stuff. And that's kind of, that, that was my forte. So I was attracted to that, got recruited out of that into undercover work, did undercover work, um, promoted out of undercover to a street sergeant, went back to patrol and was a sergeant. And through my sergeant tenure, I was a sergeant almost 10 years. And through that 10 years, I was a patrol sergeant. I was a uh, training sergeant. I was an academy sergeant. Uh, I was a, I went back to undercover as an undercover sergeant. And then, uh, got from undercover. I went into motors. I stood up our, our first motor unit. So I was back in traffic and then uh, promoted out of traffic as a Lieutenant. And when I, at this whole time, I, we have a collateral duty SWAT team. So I was on SWAT as a, you know, brand new SWAT guy, mm -hmm. uh, operator. And then I moved into a team leader position as a Sergeant. And so when I promoted to Lieutenant, I promoted into the Lieutenant over SWAT, which is called our SWAT commander. And so I was a SWAT commander and I had narcotics and our anti-smuggling um, were assigned to me. And so I was a lieutenant there, uh, I think four or five years and went back to patrol for a short stint and then back to SWAT narcotics and anti-smuggling. And uh, that was in 2016. That came to an end when uh, this guy got elected to sheriff and he offered me the position to be his number two. And I took him up on that. And uh, 2017, we moved in as the, the new administration for the agency, and we've been there for the past seven years in that role. So wow. it sounds like a ton of street credibility, street experience, uh, you know, and then now you're an admin. I know. Dude. Now you're an admin. <laughs> this guy. It's all good. I am. You said I your am fingers were sore from typing. Yeah. Yeah. Credibility. Was, yeah. credibility. <laughs> you were quivering when you said that. Yeah. 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 It's a lot no, of credibility. Awesome. That's awesome. Sounds like you've done, you've had a hell of a career then. It's a, that's awesome. I've had some fun. Yep. And you're now a book author. Yeah. I, yeah, I wrote a book about some of the fun I had. Yeah. Is that the first book that you've written? <laughs> that is. Yeah. That's the only book that I've written. And, uh, and uh, honestly, the sheriff's books are what kind of prompted this book uh, because I had a lot of stories. He and I obviously spent a lot of time together. And so that first year as we were really getting to know each other because we didn't really know each other uh, prior to him offering me this position. Um, as we got to know each other and I told him some of these stories, he kept telling me, dude, you got to write a book. You got to write a book. And then yeah. he wrote his and he kind of walked me through the process, which prompted me to get off my butt and write a book. Nice. Oh, very cool. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get into the book a little bit later, but uh, Sheriff, 
Welcome. Yeah, man. Sorry, my voice is out. It's all good. I'm a real boy. Yeah. <laughs> You're nervous. We get it. Yeah, we get it. <laughs> He's nervous around cameras. And stuff. Yeah. I keep thinking every time I talk, my voice is going to be there, but it's not. That's yeah. all right. That's all good. Um, I promise. I'm 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 becoming a man. <laughs> we believe. Uh, I took a little bit more of an unconventional route to law enforcement. Honestly, I grew up never thinking about being a cop. Never thought of it. Never crossed my mind. Didn't grow up as a kid. Um, I got out of. I uh, went on a mission for my church to Argentina, lived in a bunch of other countries and uh, came home and my dad was a businessman. So I just got into business, started working for myself. And um, at one point I uh, had a, a job as a herdsman on a dairy, which I loved. We talked about it earlier. Yeah, It's honest work. It's good work, but it just doesn't pay what it should. And yeah. uh, it's your life. It consumes your life. And I just wanted to do more. And so went back to owning my own businesses and, and just was kind of pushing through and figuring out what I wanted to do. I knew I wasn't doing what I want, what I felt like I should be doing. And uh, one of my neighbors who actually Matt met the other night at my son's wedding, but one of my neighbors actually uh, said, Hey man, you, you want to do a ride along? And I was like, man, eh. <laughs> sure. Why sure. Not? Nothing yeah. else going on. And uh, he worked on an Indian reservation right next to Phoenix or right next to Mesa, Tempe and Scottsdale. Okay. So I decided to go, we do a graveyard shift on that shift. We had a call where there was a 20 year old, uh, a dad who had caught a 20 year old with his 14 year old daughter, mm. get into a little fist, fist of cuffs. The kid runs out the back. Um, we show up and if you've been to the reservation, they'll be like a house and then behind it, you'll have nothing, you know, yeah. and they may be in an old abandoned trailer. And, and so, uh, I'm out there armed with a, a flashlight and courage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking out there and I see this old abandoned trailer and I walk up there and I look through the window and I see this pile of debris and clothes. And I look and I see what I think is a quarter size of skin in that pile of clothes. Hmm. And I'm like, Hey, I think this guy's right in here. Yeah. So they go barging in there, boom, he's in there. They drag him out, tase him, throw him on the ground, <laughs> cuff him up. That morning I went home and I said, I woke my wife up and I said, hey, I'm gonna be a cop. <laughs> really? Six months later, I was in the academy, I was a cop. I was 34 years old when I went through the academy. Wow, wow. Um, about six, seven years into it, I was a gang and drug detective. I didn't like where the country was going. Um, I thought they were undermining the rule of law. You could see there was, they were really deteriorating the confidence the American public had in police. And so I was like, you know what, screw it. I'm gonna run for sheriff. I remember the other gang and drug detectives were like, nah, you're crazy. <laughs> I was like, no man, serious, I'm gonna run for sheriff. <laughs> so like, oh. unbeknownst to them, I put my application into Pinal County and uh, about 10 years into it, I was at Pinal County. No, about seven years I went to Pinal County. Uh, was there for a couple of years. I remember the first day I was there riding with my FTO. He's like, uh, I said, hey, when I become sheriff, we're not going to do it that way. He's like, oh, get nice. out of here. Yeah, I'm confident. Yes. yes. Yeah. He's the like, sheriff. whatever. I know, man, I'm serious. I mean, this is my first day at this, at this new agency. And he's like, oh, whatever. And I go, no, no, seriously. When I become sheriff, we're not going to do it this way. And a couple of years later, I left so I could run for sheriff, came back, I knew nothing about politics, but I knew marketing and I knew, um, you know, running a business. And so I got into it, uh, decided to run for sheriff in 2015. I uh, almost didn't. I almost decided not to do it. But uh, I told my wife, actually, one day I was called her from Utah. I was working in Utah. And I said, hey, I'm not going to do this. I've read too much stuff. I'm, I'm just not going to do it. And then uh, she she said, OK. The next day, I couldn't shake the feeling. The next day, I couldn't shake the feeling. So I call her back and I said, screw it, let's do it. Yep. And so I ran for sheriff in 2016, 2017. I won, or in 2016, took office in 2017. Um, it was a no-brainer. I called, I actually, my, my, so Matt's my chief deputy. My deputy chief over the road was one of my sergeants. And I called him and I said, hey, would you be the chief deputy? And if you know this guy, he's as humble as they come, but just solid, loyal. And he just said, no, nah, I'm not the guy for it, but you, you need to have Matt Thomas do it. Huh. And so I had known Matt, um, but I not, not, we didn't know each other that well. And so, I mean, I immediately, we gave him the job cause I trusted that guy. And, uh, and you know, he's been an amazing leader and where we're at as a sheriff's office is 
partly because of me, but a lot because of him and the other chiefs and the other supervisors we have. I get to go out and be the face of the agency, but they get to go out. They do all the work. They do the dirty work. So I just get to take credit for it. But uh, that's kind of my story in a nutshell as far as law enforcement relates. When I ran for sheriff, I'd been a cop for 10 years. And uh, a lot of people said, well, you haven't been a leader. And I said, no, leadership is not defined by uh, stripes on your sleeves or bars on your collars. Leadership is defined by how you lead, by what kind of person you are, what your value system is. I mean, there's so much to leadership, but um, one thing we've known is it doesn't, you don't have to be a, a, a captain or a lieutenant or any of those things be, prior to being a leader. Yeah. Um, a leader is, is, is what's in you and your ability to command and lead other people and do it in a way that they want to follow you. So and Two cool side stories. Uh, so he said that I, I, I met his first FTO, or actually the guy who gave him the ride along that turned him into a cop. I met that guy the other night and and uh, we were at his son's wedding and he says, Matt, do you remember me? And I'm like, nah, sorry, dude, I, I don't remember you. And he said, you taught me in the academy. And so I was like, what universe am I in where this is the dude, I was his RTO in the academy. And then he becomes the guy that gives my now sheriff the ride along that turns him into a cop. And, I, you know, it's wow. just one of those That's things where crazy. if you believe in a higher power, you know yeah. that things align exactly how wow. they're supposed That's to align. That's divine providence. You know, yeah. Things work out the way they're supposed to work out. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, you know, obviously Matt had trained this guy good enough to where I felt like, hey, I want to do this profession too. Yeah. And so I came in, did it, and uh, I've enjoyed every minute of it. And the pressing question that everybody's going to ask, because he did do his mission in Argentina, is does he speak Spanish? Si, sí, habla español. Yeah. Oh. Hablo el castellano, che. Oh, no. So we're going to do a uh, Spanish version of the podcast. Yeah. yeah. So pretty like unconventional how you guys or how you started your career. I mean, that's pretty unheard of. I mean, in, in all reality, you don't see that very often. What I'm kind of curious uh, before we get into it, like what was the feeling in the, the atmosphere with the other deputies and I guess all of the staff at the sheriff's department when you're a pretty new there, you're how old at that time? Uh, let's see, when I ran 2016, I was uh, 44. Okay. So I don't know. What was the vibe around the department with you running for sheriff? Was Did you have the backing? Um, so the guys that were there before me, they had lost the morale. So the morale was low. Mm -hmm. um, and I had come there and worked there for two years. And Pinal County is big. It's the size of the state of Connecticut. It's 5,400 square miles. So you barely know the guys on your squad, let alone any of the other guys throughout the agency. We know them because we're the, we're the leadership. Yeah. But a lot of you, if you're just a, your, your patrol guys don't necessarily know each other. And I could see I needed to do more. So I play softball. So I started playing softball with all these guys playing in tournaments. And so in the two years I was there, I actually got to know quite a few people from different regions a lot of the different guys. So they, at least they knew somewhat of me, mm -hmm. um, but they knew they didn't want the other guys. And that helped me. Yeah, I'm not going to yeah. say that it, that it was all me, that it was probably more so they didn't want the other guys, which benefited me. Um, and I think they saw in me, they like, Hey, I think this guy might do a good job. It helped once they knew who we promoted, like Matt coming on as the chief deputy that started getting even more of trust from them, more buy-in, um, but even then it still took us, uh, it took us years to get the agency to a point where we really kind of wanted it, it was, to be. It was really like a uh, battered wife syndrome, man. It was like a DV type of relationship where the agency had just come out of this horrible relationship mm -hmm. with our sheriff at the time. And now we have a new sheriff who seems to be the new great boyfriend, but everybody is still hesitant because they're like, wait, <laughs> when's he going to hit us? Because, you know, the last yeah. guys kept hitting us. Yeah. Um, and so it took us a while to say, like, look, dude, this is it's all good. Yeah. We're, we're not going to hit you. We actually love you <laughs> and, and yeah. move forward. It was like two, three years into it. We would get with somebody and they'd say, why are you why do you feel this way? Well, because they disciplined somebody for this. And I'll be like, well, when was that? It was five years ago. I was like, we've been here for three years <laughs> yeah, and we've done, never done that. Yeah. So you've got to start to let those things go. If you're, if we're ever going to have success, you got to let go of the things that we, we had no control over and had no part in. Yeah. Yeah. And the leadership role, they do talk a lot about that. You know, people that do develop jackets, <clears throat> in, which happens in law enforcement in a negative way, you know, you do have to learn to allow people to shed that jacket because mm -hmm. it's just at the end of the day, then it just wouldn't be fair. Right, right to, to right. that person. To and that's been one up. of our, our keys to success moving forward. Um, and, and 
I think I'm at a disadvantage over him. His advantage is that a lot of these guys that have jackets uh, from back in the day and, and have in a sense been blackballed. Yeah. Um, a lot of those guys, he doesn't know that history. So uh, it doesn't give him any bad subjective opinion of them where I know the history. And so I've got to override that. And, and we talk to our leaders a lot about this is take the emotion out of your decision making. Like, I, I don't care how I feel about this guy. It's how is this guy performing? And can he do the job that I'm asking him to do? If the answer is yes, then it doesn't matter what I feel about him. If I like him or not, that doesn't play into it. Um, and, and for me, that's a disadvantage because I have to I have to consciously override that sometimes yeah. when we're doing so like promotions, it, it gets tough sometimes because you'll have a preconceived notion about this person based on their history and their performance, but you have to override that and give them the shot that they deserve to, to try and step up. What, what I find really fascinating is <clears throat> where I come in from in law enforcement, it was you promote within, you move up, you have to do a certain amount of time and then you get those people that move up quickly. And there's always a perception of, well, they don't have that experience. They're not sure what they're doing. What I find interesting about your guys' case is you are the sheriff after owning businesses, you come with that business model and then you've promoted and done virtually everything internal and then you come together and it's like, that's like a power couple and you've clearly changed your organization. And, and I, I mean, we've reached out to you, like we recognize it and it's a great thing. And I like the fact that you've come from a business aspect and you, you're changing the culture of law enforcement because that's what needs to happen. Right. And we talked about it at lunch, you know, too many of the leaders in law enforcement, this is all they've ever known. And it's not a knock on them. It's just when you're institutionalized to this, to the way the business is done, it is very, un cops hate two things. <laughs> They hate the way things are and they hate change. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> and you yeah. become institutionalized to just how law enforcement is supposed to be done. And so when somebody comes in and says, eh, we're not going to do it that way anymore. We're going to do it this way. It is uncomfortable for the majority of police officers and especially guys who have been in it for 20, 30 years who are now chiefs. They just don't always see it. So I brought in a, a very broad uh, idea of what we could do a business idea, a business approach to running a sheriff's office, treating it like we're going to brand our business and we're going to sell this product to our customers, which is our community. And we're going to, and they're also our investors. We're going to show them that they're getting good return on investment. What Matt brought to the table was the regimented part of it. Like this is how we, this is the lines that we try to stay within and so sometimes I've been way off the reservation <laughs> and Matt's like, no, we got to, I get it, but we can't be that far off the reservation. And we find the balance of long-term policing meets marketing meets new ways of doing things in this in industry. And that's really been the, the benefit that he brings with the, the experience. I bring this whole different mindset of how we should do it. And Together, you can see the finished product that what we've been able to produce. And it's it it takes some getting getting to, right? It doesn't just happen overnight. Our first year probably together um, was a lot of learning each other, learning how we think, how we and and just having discussions of of you know my style versus his style. And ultimately, he's the sheriff, so his style wins every time in the end. And I recognize that but having the ability to, to voice my opinion. And that was one of the things we had honest discussions going into this. And that's a lot of the behind the scenes that people don't know is when he offered me the position, actually when, when the guy he was talking about first reached out and said, Hey Matt, um, you know, Mark Lamb's going to run for sheriff wants to know if you'll be his number two. And I'm like, dude, get the hell out of here. Like, what do you actually want? And he's <laughs> like, no, dude, that's like legit what's going to happen. And he, that's what he wants to know. And I'm like, nah, dude, stop messing with me, blah, blah, blah. Cause he's a jokester. We call him the emperor cause he's the emperor of jokes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I thought he was messing around. Finally, we get down to it and he's like, dude, I'm serious. He wants to know. And I said, well, look, dude, I'm a Lieutenant in the agency. Uh, if he's looking for somebody to give him dirt on these guys so that he can use for his campaign, I'm not the guy. And he's like, dude, that's not what he wants. He just wants to know an answer to the question. <laughs> and I'm like, well, yes, I would be interested. And to his credit, he, he basically said, I understand where you're at. I understand your current role. I don't want to communicate with you at all until we get to the point we need to communicate. Mm -hmm. And so we never talked 
<clears throat> excuse me, we never talked until we got to the, I think it was after the primary oh. that we wow, had. Really? So he had won the primary. Then we had a discussion about, hey, here's here's what I'm thinking. And then uh, I, I was really blown away at the interview process because um, when he said, hey, I, I want to interview you because there's a couple people I'm talking to. You're the front runner. And I said, okay. And he says, me and my wife want to come meet with you and your wife. And I was like, Huh. Never taken my wife to an interview, yeah. bro. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but to his credit, it was he had a very specific reason. And so we met and he explained to me his values, his mission, his objectives, and that family was of the utmost importance and that it needed to be a, an all in thing. Not only me, but my family <laughs> had to be comfortable with this decision and we all had to be in it together. And that's why we had the wives there too for the decision. And he was talking for about five minutes and I was just like, dude, I'm in, I'm, I'm all in. Like wow. you're talking my language and we kind of went forward from there. And, and so it, it just started as a, as a good starting point because we had an understanding of each other. He knew where I was coming from. I knew where he was coming from and, and we pushed forward in the first year we had some stumbles, you know, cause I, again, I, I've, he's the sheriff. And so uh, I don't know if he'll ever admit this, but he had to get used to being the sheriff because the the first funny story we have is we go up to the executive suite, which is on our third floor of our building. And he's like, Hey, what office do you want? I'm like, bro, you're the sheriff. <laughs> yeah. Like you tell me what office yeah. I'm getting. And he's like, That's well, wild. which one do you want? And I'm like, you're the sheriff, dude, you pick. And and so it was the first funny little thing where we were like, you, you have no idea who you are right now. Right? Like you yeah, don't know. Your probably not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it takes time. Yeah. It takes time. Huh. And you know, for anybody out there, that's a leader that's taken over in a different position is there's always a, 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 a feeling out process of trust. Yeah. I, yeah. And you can't undermine it. You know, you've got to grow into it. And so there's the yin and the yang of it. And there's the times where, you got people saying, oh, they're Matt's trying to take your job, run for sheriff. And so you have to be solid in where you what the, vi the vision is, the mission is for what we're doing with the agency. And that's where we were always were. And so we were able to find each other's <clears throat> grooves and what works. And I don't get in the way. And he respects that ultimate authority of the sheriff. And everybody kind of does their job. And we've been successful because we let people do their job. I don't, I'm the sheriff. I ain't got time to go be the chief or the lieutenant or the sergeant. I ain't got time for that. Yeah. I need you to do your job and go out and do it. And I'm not going to get in your way. You let me know if you need anything. And we all kind of settled into that and pushed that downward. It was harder than, that took even longer. Yeah. Yeah. That took several years like we talked about. But, um, but yeah, just finding, I think really is, this is the problem with the world today. Nobody wants to find common ground. Everybody wants to, to hold the fort. You know, they all want to build up walls and say, look, I'm not coming over there. I don't like who you are. Mm -hmm. And we don't find common ground. I met with uh, Mayorkas yesterday. I had a great meeting. You know why I didn't go in as an adversary? I went in as a, as a fellow American, as a fellow law enforcement guy. We had a great conversation. We talked about the things that we had in common. We know we, we don't, we're not on the same page on other things, but we found that common ground and ultimately we had a great meeting um, because you find the common ground. So most people they look for, or they're not confident in themselves enough to know that they think that when somebody does something, it's to get, it's to backdoor yeah. them or something. <clears throat> yeah. You've got to be very confident in who you are, what your mission is, and allow your people to be confident in who they are and what their mission is and to do their job. Yeah. Well, I think your leadership shows that because you're both here. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like you travel together. I mean, we spent the afternoon with you. You're, right. You mesh incredibly well, but your agency is still running and it's, and you're confident with that. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. what's interesting uh, to me about culture, especially in, in a law enforcement community is culture takes so long to build. Yes. Like, and you guys are describing that, but it takes, it's, it, you can crush it so fast and like the battered, wife, domestic violence syndrome. Yeah. That's pretty common in, in police departments, right. you know, in, in right. all reality. Yeah. Uh, and to get over that, man, it really is. It is so hard to like build a positive culture when you're at that level. Well, if you think about it, it I mean, years. just, just societal, right. Just, just think of the, the society we live in and just all the stuff that goes on with friendships, relationships, uh, marriages, when there's broken trust, dude, like you could build that trust for years 
and you're solid and one moment of broken trust yeah, and you've it. damaged that for a long time and it's hard to get that back. And so now you're talking about a whole agency that has a broken trust with their administration and we're trying to build that into the sheriff's point. Like I was, and I, I've had this conversation with lieutenants like, dude, I was one of you. Like I went through that with you. Yeah. So I get it. And, but they still didn't trust, you know, because they had been just, they had the, the broken trust. And so it is, it's difficult. And we believe in, you got to build a bank account. So you build a bank account, not only within your agency, but within your community. And that bank account is small deposits. You know, yeah. you want to wear your beards in November and December. That's a small deposit. Mm -hmm. You know, the old guys made them cover their tattoos. We came in and said, look, I don't have any <laughs> tattoos, but we came in and said, you don't have to cover your tattoos unless they're obscene. These are all little small things, but what it starts to do is it deposits in. So then when you do have that thing where you have to discipline somebody or, or the, where normally the agency would be like, oh, we hate the administration because they discipline Kyle, mm -hmm. you know, we've gained that trust with all the little deposits. Yeah. It's the same with the community. You got to do things that benefit the community. Little videos here, show the good things you're doing because when those withdrawals come, they, which they will come and the withdrawals are always heavier than the deposits. And if you got nothing in your bank account, that's what happens like in Minnesota or all these other places. Yeah. Um, and it happens. It's not just within your community. Don't forget to put deposits in the bank account of trust within your own employees. And that starts by letting them do their job, making sure they have the equipment, standing behind them when they get into a shooting or some type of major thing where they need support. Um, all of those things matter. And that's what builds that. That's what helps you transcend those withdrawals. Well, I think that kind of dovetails a little bit into, we wanted to talk about recruiting and retention because that seems to be the number one problem that most agencies across the country are having. And yep. you guys are have seemed to nail it. And you talked about it already, Sheriff, and that's the uh, marketing side of it and yeah. the business aspect that you bring to the table. And what you guys do is pretty interesting. I mean, you guys are like on the forefront of social media, now YouTube, you know, with your Fridays with Frank, we were talking about people get a kick out of that stuff. And if you look at the views on YouTube on it, it's in the hundreds and thousands. So can we talk a little bit about um, what kind of drove that idea? I'm curious, Matt, like when he presented that idea to you, knowing <laughs> like, one? yeah, knowing, <laughs> knowing your background yeah. uh, in law enforcement, which is similar to, to us, you know, yeah. just some average street cops. Um, and then now you've got a guy that comes in and he's your boss and he's like, we're going to do these things on social media and, and bring in, you know, uh, videographers and all this stuff like well, that pretty much goes against what we have all done in law enforcement. Yeah. And, and it does, it goes against the traditional grain, but I'll be quite honest with you how it all started, uh, was, was me. I, I don't want to say, I don't want to take full credit for it because I, it was a conversation that I had that I then relate to him that started this ball rolling, right? And so there, there were two things that helped us progress forward. And uh, one of them was I had always felt the way that we did PIO work in uh, law enforcement was wrong. We tried to train cops to be professionals in media mm -hmm. and they knew nothing about that world. And so that was one of the things I told him that, that I felt we needed to switch and we needed to recruit from the media world and just teach them about the cop stuff. That would be way easier. So that was one of our first moves. And then one of our other moves is uh, I had done some media work locally because we had the spotlight on us for a few years because of the smuggling stuff. So I had made a lot of contacts in the, the, the TV world. And uh, so one of those contacts reached out and said, Hey, there's this new thing called live PD. And we want you guys uh, to, to like talk to us about it. And, and we'd like to, have your agency on board. And this particular guy is a good friend of mine. And I said, dude, we are literally like two to three months into our new administration. I do not have time for this bullshit. So, uh, no, we'll pass. <laughs> it's a hard pass. And we'll talk to you later, like later in the year to see if it's even a possibility. So I kind of let him know like, Hey, this guy said this, but really, dude, we need to focus. And he was on board. He was like, yeah, man, we got way too much going on right now. I would say we're like baby deer on ice. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> they, uh, they did. They, they, he came back later that year. It was October. It was towards middle, middle of October. I think it was maybe late October. Yeah, was, I think it was like 
somewhere uh, September, October, somewhere yeah. in there. So they come back and they said, Hey, we, we want to talk to you about it. And I said, okay. So I told him, Hey, they, they want to interview me to see if we fit what they want or are looking for. And he's like, do it. So, okay. So I had gone to Colorado for a sheriff's training on a Monday, flew on a Sunday, started on a Monday, started the conversations on Monday. Yeah. Wow. And, and so by Friday they were filming. Yeah. No, shit. no so way. I, I do the interview and they're, they said, we'll call you back. And they literally called back, I think within 30 minutes. And they said, okay, we, you guys are in and we want to be there filming next week. And I was like, holy shit, whoa. Like there's a lot that needs to be done, right? With contracts, IGAs, all that kind of crap, right? And so we slowed the boat down a little yeah. bit. Um, and and then uh, the sheriff kind of took it from there. Yeah. Well, and we came in when I told Matt, I said, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to brand the agency. We're going to make Pinal County a brand name. Not, I want everybody in the state to know where Pinal County is, and we want people in the country to know. Look, when we we're Pinal County is between Phoenix and Tucson, but f- the majority of our competition is Chandler PD, Mesa PD, Phoenix PD, Gilbert PD. Like we have all these big agencies that pay more. They're they're great places to work, and so the only way to compete with them is you got to your product has to be more enticing to. Yeah. Your cl- to the client and the client is who do I want to come work for me? So we set out to where we said, look, we need new guys and we also need seasoned guys. And so we started branding our agency to seasoned veterans that would bring the experience to the table who already knew they wanted to do the job. Unlike the new kids who still don't know, they like do it for a couple <laughs> yeah. of years and decide yeah. it's not for them. Yeah. And plus the retirement changes, there's a whole myriad of things. The second thing was, is I said, look, I'm not going to be like everybody else. I'm not wearing a uniform for the most part. For one, I think that's what the deputies wear. And I'm not pretending to do the job. I can't stand it when chiefs show up in a uniform that I know they haven't been out on the road, done a daggum thing in a long time. And so those troops are out there doing that work every day. And so I said, I'm going to be different. And I, I told him, I said, yeah. look, you're gonna, we're going to get pushback. There's going to be a lot of people talking crap, all the long-term cops. They're not comfortable with that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, but just give it like six months. It'll be fine. And yeah. Yeah. sure enough, about six it months was, later, if I started wearing <laughs> uniforms, they'd be like, oh, this looks weird. Yeah, yeah. I think it was, it was two things. It was uh, that, that specific conversation where he was talking about branding and stuff. He's like, I'm going to allow goatees and I'm not going to wear a uniform. And I'm like, Oh man, you're killing me, bro. Cause <laughs> I'm a, I'm a uniform guy. And, and I said, you're the sheriff. You can do whatever you want. And I said, but from me down, uh, that, that should be uniforms. And he's like, no, I'm just, I'm talking me, the sheriff. And I'm like, all right, I, I can live with that. That's a, that's a good, we're, we're good. <laughs> and then he said the goatees and I was like, oh man, I'm, <laughs> I'm still, I'm a traditional uniform guy, the goatee yeah. and He's like, trust me. And I said, okay, man, let's do it. And surprisingly, and and I had been institutionalized, right? And because I was like, oh, I don't know if the citizens are going to like it, you know, because you're you're pounded over your career. This is the way we do things. This, yeah. is, the way, this is what the citizens want. And I'm here to tell you guys, a lot of that is bullshit. Um, it's not yeah. what the citizens want. It's what particular people in charge want. Yeah. And then they push that on you. Because what we found instantly is that our guys loved it. Um, it. It just by itself, the goatee increased morale, which is amazing, right? The tattoos increased morale because the guys with tattoos, like me, I, it's an expression of, of stuff that means something to me. And so they wanted the same thing, the goatee. It's an easy solution to let them just wear some facial hair. And now we're full beard. We allow full beards. Um, but all of that stuff got us those investment points. And the public was like, oh, this is great. We love it. We, we, they're, they're like us. And, and yeah. so we quickly found out like, oh my God, I should have taken the blue pill and I've been taking the red pill the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not nothing fire, wrong with not, the blue not pill. Firefighter pills, guys. No, 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 no. The, the matrix stuff. <laughs> and you know, one of the other things we did for recruiting is we saw, we saw this woke culture. We saw this push against the rule of law, uh, trying to demean police officers and what we do. And we leaned in to the opposite. We leaned into police work, good old fashioned, hard police work, where you go out, you you're, you protect the constitutional rights of the people, you treat your citizens good, but you hold your criminals accountable. 
And we started showcasing that on social media. We saw a real opportunity, not just live PD, not just 60 days in. We started showcasing it on media. We weren't afraid to show you that if you get out of line, our dog's going to bite you. Or um, if you will chase you, if you run from us. And that, that sent a message to all the police officers out there that if you want to still be a cop, come work for us. Yeah. It's, uh, it's funny too, you know, we talk about like these, these small little wins, you go to these little leadership summits and stuff. And they always, you know, these top chiefs and, you know, top heads are always talking about like, Hey, how can we increase, you know, how can we get quick little wins? Right. And I think like small things like the beard and you may not like it. There, there's look, there's a lot of people out there, right, Matt, yeah. like you said, and, and I, I'm, a, I'm on the same page as you. I'm very old school. Right. I like the uniform, traditional uniform. Um, but I went to this summit and there was a prior chief there and he said the same thing and he's like look we were looking for small wins for our department okay just what can we do to boost morale now and he wanted to he entertained the beard thing and he was highly against it in fact his his staff was highly against it a captain worked <coughs> for him said absolutely not we're not doing that well he was in his hotel room one night and he said i'm the chief i'm making this decision i'm not telling anybody i'm doing it he came out announced it to his department that they were going to do a one-year um you know trial run of it see if they're going to get any complaints out of it from the citizens like you talked about and he said you know what at the end of that one year he goes you know how many people stopped calling 911 zero right. not one person That's right. how many complaints did they get none right. they didn't get any right. and so you know he talked a lot about like what you just said is is it is it something like personal that you don't like and you're pushing it on your people mm -hmm. because you can, yep. um, or is it really affecting anything? And it, it truth be told, it's not, um, leaders but, tend to get in their own way most of the time. I know. And it's, it's, yeah. it's crazy, right? Because you can dish out these small wins to boost morale and it, how much does a, a beard cost? Yes. Yeah, it's yeah, free. Nothing, how much does a tattoo cost to you? Nothing. Uh, you're yeah. not paying for right, it. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, you yeah. are when you're getting the tattoo, yeah. but I'm just saying in general, as the sheriff, and you, or a chief and you want to push that down, that's not costing the city, the county, it's not costing you anything. Right. And you're still getting that little win. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why would you not want to invest in that? Well, and we would we, go ahead. And I was just going to say, we don't look at the open market enough. Look, they say that eight out of 10 businesses that exist today won't exist in 10 years. What does yeah, that true. say? That means that everything changes. Um, 10 years ago, Facebook was barely coming around. You know what I mean? 15, 20 years ago, we didn't even have computers in our houses. And if we did, they were big clunky things. So like things change, but in law enforcement, we just have this way of wanting to keep everything the same. Yet we're not, the world's passing us by. And that is exactly what we got caught in, in, in the late 2000s. And then again, in the, in uh, 2020, mm -hmm. we got caught because law enforcement refused to progress along with everybody else. And it's not big things. It's just little things. And because of that, we find ourselves behind the eight ball again. And so now it takes work to get on top of it. Well, and one thing that we talk about quite a, a bit with leaders is uh, the illusion of control because it's an absolute illusion. But the problem is as cops, we're used to controlling, right? We're used to controlling scenes, controlling events and trying to minimize damage and loss of life and loss of property and all that stuff. So we're used to controlling but when it comes to stuff like this and when it comes to leadership, you can't control. And so it's all an illusion. And so you have these old school thinkers that think I can control my agency. I can control how people think about us by controlling stupid stuff like beards and tattoos. And and it's all just an illusion. And, and we try to tell our people, let's let's just go with what we feel is right. Not what somebody tells us or not what some leadership school says, what feels right to you? Like, does it feel right to make this move? And if it does, and it's the right reasons and it's the right thing, then let's do it and be damned with the naysayers because they're the ones that are sitting there spinning their wheels and wondering why can't we recruit? Why can't we retain? It's because you can't get out of that box you're stuck in. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And the sad thing is that it's probably the, if you were to do a poll with police departments or sheriff's departments, it's probably the number one complaint they're going to have is right now is recruitment and retention right. everywhere. Yeah. And I will tell you, a lot of that falls on them too, because a lot of guys have the ability to go out and do it, but don't believe in themselves enough to go step up and be a lieutenant yeah. or a captain. Yeah. 
It's never going to change if we don't get the people with the right mindset. Matt was willing to take a chance. He went from lieutenant to a, an at-will position as a chief deputy. I went from having to leave the profession, run for office, jump back in it as a sheriff. I was fortunate enough to win. But unless you're willing to take some of those quantum leaps in life, there's a great book, U Squared. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read it, it's an awesome book. talks about taking those quantum leaps in life and and uh, you've got to be willing to take the chance because if if you know we don't get good people trying to get in leadership positions, then we're going to end up with the same crap. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What is your? I'm curious on the leadership portion. What your not necessarily the selection process, but what do you look for in a leader? Because maybe seven years ago when you came in, right, it was difficult to to make a little bit of change. But now that it's kind of the ball's in motion, and people are like, okay, these are great ideas. Well, we, we we had to do it right off the bat because if you think about it. Um, when he took office, he immediately created vacancies that we had to fill. So I left the SWAT team. I, I, I left command of the SWAT team, narcs, and our anti-smuggling as the lieutenant. So I immediately had to fill mm-hmm. that void. So we had to find a leader that could fill that void. Um, our third in command, we had to fill his void. So we had to fill some voids. And then naturally, as an incoming sheriff, there's some people that he knew right off the bat do not fit in his command level. And so there were people that were leaving that we had to fill those roles. So what we had to, uh, I had to get his vision of what he wanted for leadership. And I had to mold that into essentially a testing process. And, and, and me, him, our third in command really worked on it, nailed it down. And, and should, I think we spent probably a month just in office going through how can we, properly test for what we're looking for in a leader. And and so we created our testing process, which it's it's not super difficult. Like when we're talking about command level leadership, executive levels, um, we created a process where they have to, they go in and there's a written process. And the written process is essay style questions because we're looking for depth in their thought process and in their leadership skills. So we ask them a very simple question. Mm -hmm. Um, It's probably a two sentence question but the expectation is a three page answer because we want them to go into depth on how they're thinking, what they're thinking, why they're thinking that and how they'll solve that question. And it gives us a good insight into their thought process and they can't game that. They can't say, well, I think they want this or I think they want that because they have to answer because it shows if they try and game the system, when they get scored, usually they fail because they're not answering what they believe and, and it shows in their writing. Um, and then from there they go into an oral presentation of their resume because we want our leaders to be able to talk. Right. And so that's a social skill that's diminishing greatly these yeah, days. Yep. So yeah. we want our leaders to go in front of like a panel like this of command level officers and tell them, here's who I am and here's why I deserve this job. So they have to go in and they give a timed resume because we want them to be cognizant of their time. We want them to be cognizant of, of how to present properly. We want them to be able to talk and we want them to be able to give their background on why they deserve to even be standing here. So they do that and then they go through an actual oral uh, command board, you know, one of your traditional command boards where they answer some, some oral board type questions. And we're looking for a more global perspective because what I find, particularly with guys that are going from sergeant to lieutenant, um, I always, when they come in, chief, we want to meet with you to talk about the testing process. Uh, I, I want to promote to lieutenant and I want to get your insight. The number one thing we both tell them is, what are you testing for? Testing for lieutenant. Start thinking like a lieutenant and start acting like a lieutenant. Yeah. That's the number one thing you need to do. And so that's what we're looking for in that oral board is, are they answering like a lieutenant or are they answering like a sergeant running a squad? And mm. and that all shows itself. And so by the end of that, when when our people that have that are ready and know what they're doing, they rise to the top naturally because they know how to do everything that we put in front of them. And, and law enforcement is at a disadvantage because we have to go through a process to become a police officer. So you're picking from a, a, a narrow field of applicants to be able to promote. If you're yeah. going to promote to a lieutenant, you're usually only testing from sergeants. So it's a very narrow field. It's not like the private sector where I can just go out and pick who I want. 
One of the issues we ran into when this administration, the prior administration, would go through a testing process, but then they really just wanted to give Mark the job. Yeah. And so then they would just give Mark the job. And so everybody quit testing. So one of the things that we had to do is we had to make it a fair test. So we we worked hard on putting the <clears throat> test together because we weren't going to have the control after that. Once the test was done, whoever was at the top of the list, that's the next guy to get promoted. Is it the ideal way to do it? No. But if you don't create some level of, of uh, cops want to know, like, hey, if I reach here, I'm, I'm the next in line. Or yeah. I want to know that it's fair. And so what we had to do is we had to accept that. Now, did we get some guys that weren't fruitful leaders? Yes. You know, but the process you put in place should weed those guys out and get the right people in place. And look, you may want a truck, but I may get a Prius. Okay. <laughs> we did talk about that. Inside yeah. joke. Yeah. Yeah. Inside joke. Yeah. 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 Kyle does have you a Prius. You may want a truck, you may get a Prius. My job as a leader, Matt's job as a leader, is to figure out how do I make that Prius work for what this, what we need. I wanted a truck. I got a Prius, but guess what? The Prius is still going to get me from point A to point B. I just got to figure out what the benefits are of that person. So that's part of your leadership too, is saying, okay, wasn't the ideal person. It wasn't who we thought we were going to get, but he's still going to, we've got to figure out what his talents and what his gifts are and figure out how we apply, how we bring those out of him, make him a good leader. And so that's a lot of leadership too, is you're not going to always get what you want, but you can turn that person into what they they're capable of being. Yeah. And, and, and the better you are and the better your leadership is above them, everybody either they rise to that, they start to rise to that level or they weed themselves out. And so what you're trying to do is create a higher level so that they continue to push up with you. So, And that's another thing that we had to work out of our leadership is getting them to understand like, hey, I, I know this guy's history and I know the confidence level of you guys in him promoting is not there, but this is a process and we have to let the process work. And your job is to best prepare that person, no matter what you think of them to be successful. Cause I had a, a, a homicide detective that schooled me way early on when I was a young deputy and he gave me the best advice of my career. He said, son, when you're working a case, if you try to prove them innocent, the truth will always come through. And if they're guilty, it'll show. And I was like, that's solid advice because we tend to look for the the guilt. Yeah. And and then, you know, that throws us off of the, the actual right trail sometimes. Yeah. And so it was some of the best advice. And it applies to leadership because if you look to make somebody successful and they suck, they're going to suck no matter how much you help them. And we've had that happen. And the other thing we're not afraid to do is put you right back to where you were successful. So if we have a sergeant that promotes to lieutenant and he can't function at that level and he's proven that over time and it's not one of those things where we're gunning for him, it's where they prove that they just cannot function at that level yet. So we put them back at the level they can properly function at and we pick somebody else and put them in there. And that is our methodology is if you test and you get through that test at number one, you're going to go. But the expectation is you're going to succeed. We're going to do everything we can to help you succeed. But if you still can't succeed, it's not a failure. It's just a setback. You've got to go back. You've got to get some more time. You've got to learn some more things. And then guess what? If you test number one next time, you're going to be right back in that spot. We're not going to blackball you and say, oh no, you fucked this up once. So you can't be back. And I you've got to, you've got to yeah, show I like that. And you've got to show them that you believe in them. When guys come up, I'm like, Kyle, I'm so congratulations on your promotion. You're going to do awesome. You know, we know you're very capable of doing this job. I look forward to seeing what you do, whatever. Because if they walk in and I'm like, and, and they see in your face that you really don't believe in them, trust me, that's the, it'll show in their performance. Yeah. But if you can show that you're, if you give them a true uh, like we're behind you 100%. We think you can do this. Um, they'll do much better. We found that they, they all seemed more cream rises to the top than, than sinks. And I think it's, that's, sorry. Uh, it's ahead. just interesting that you say that because I remember a lot of people getting promoted on these lists, sergeants and lieutenants, and everybody's perception just immediately goes to they suck or I don't want to work for them. And I don't want to fucking listen. Like, they're just damned already without even giving that opportunity. I 
I like the fact that you're like, no, no, no. Well, then <laughs> one, you're one getting the, that. One of the keys to our success, and and I, I have a bad delivery method in in well, probably in a lot of instances. <laughs> hey, so do I. <laughs> so that's my number one complaint from people. Yeah. Your delivery and, sucks. And and so Sorry. my delivery sucks <laughs> on occasion. I've, that's one of my weaknesses <laughs> that I've been working on. But uh, one of the things that we do when we do promote somebody is we communicate with them, our expectations and the perception of them. And so when we promoted our first captains, I sat both captains down and I said, Hey, you know, welcome aboard. Here's the expectations, blah, blah, blah. By the way, as your leader, here's the things I see as your deficits. And here's what you're known for throughout the agency. The things that people won't tell you in front of your face that they'll say behind your back. Um, I'm going to tell you those things and I'm only telling you because I want you to be successful. I want you to understand how people perceive you, what people think of you, what I see as your deficiencies. And I'm telling all of this up front because I'm going to help you work on it however I can, because I want to see you successful. And I want you to overcome those deficiencies because you're going to be a better leader when you do. Now, again, some is my delivery. Some is ego. Um, some people get really butthurt when you do that. Uh, but the guys who have went, I, and I've had this happen, like, holy shit, I didn't even know that people thought of me that way. Yeah. Like, yeah, dude, that's, that's how you're viewed. Um, and those guys that accept that feedback and humble themselves a little bit and say, cool. I want to attack those problems and they get after it. Some of our best leaders. Yeah. And that's where the benefit of, I can be the guy that's like, you're going to do great. And Matt's the guy that says, you're going to do great. You got to work on this and this and this. Interesting. And I'm the guy that continues to say, Hey, I keep hearing nothing but good things about you. Keep doing that. Keep doing it. So there's a balance. You've got to have some people in your place that are, are going to have some tough conversations, but I'm also the guy that is not afraid to say, Hey, we got to let you go. You know, that's just the way it is. Yeah. It's a business for me. It's a business, but you've got to have Matt, Matt and I work real well with, together because I can be the good guy. He can be the good guy, but he can be the honest guy and say, look, you got to work on these things and these things. And we well, have, we, we jokingly said in, in the very beginning, I told him, I said, look, any good news is all you. Any bad news, I'm the guy. Because yeah, I, I'm my, guy. by design, the number two is the guy, right? I'm the yeah. guy that delivers yeah. the, the bad news. I'm the True. asshole, all that. I, and I told him, I said, I don't have to get elected, dude. You do. So, you know, yeah. that, that's, a, that's a thing, whether you want to admit it or not. And, yeah. and honestly, he's the head of the agency. He's the face of the agency. So it is his, his job to bring the positivity. And, to, and so, in, you know, uh, Colonel Powell was a phenomenal leader. And, and one of his sayings was you bring the weather. Right. And so that's the sheriff's job. He brings the weather. If he comes in, he's like, All everything guys. sucks. Yeah. This sucks. Like California, baby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but if, if he came in like that, people would be like, oh, this sucks. But when he comes in and he's like, you're doing great. You're doing great. We're all doing great. Then they're like, oh shit. We're, yeah, it's, it's good. And then again, I'm the guy that pulls them aside and says, you are doing great, but we just got a few things to work on. Then they're like, fucking Thomas is an asshole. Uh, but you know, I'm going to, I'm going to work on those things. Yeah. I, I bet you guys did that on that plane today. When you guys circled the airport, you got on <laughs> sheriff and you're yeah. like, Hey, brand new pilot. You're going to do a good job. Yeah. Well, you were sleeping through it. So disclaimer real quick. So everybody knows <laughs> they had a day one or first flight pilot yeah. uh, on their flight over here into the beautiful California, which they were so excited to come. <laughs> and uh, Mark and I are sitting in the parking lot, <laughs> like, you know, waiting for their plane to land. And we're like, oh, that's got to be their plane timing wise, whatever thing comes down to land and goes, nope. And then takes back. Off. Yeah. And I'm thinking, Shit, that's not good. Yeah, didn't even have the landing gear down. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. A little sketch, but. I, I actually think that's what happened. The, the, the pilot got on uh, the main pilot who was training the rookie pilot. <laughs> got on and said, oh, we, we came in a little high. And so we have to make another <laughs> yeah. ride. I think the pilot forgot to drop the landing gear and realized, oh shit, we're about to land. Oops. We got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It never Tyler came down. Kyle and I were like, like hey, there's something wrong with that plane. Like yeah, it's not no coming down. down, bro. Yeah. So yeah. They almost died coming here, but, um, anyways, I mean, no one ever really does California. a flyby. Yeah. At so Sac International. You guys trash talk California. Um, <laughs> yeah. all right. Two things. I, I two things I want to say to your guys' point. One of the things that my department does, I think, well, is when you do test, for sergeant and lieutenant positions, they send out 360 
monkey surveys, right? right? I don't know if you guys do this or not, but survey monkey, like survey online. Monkey. Yeah. Oh, did I say monkey surveys or <laughs> I don't know what whatever. you said. Whatever. Survey monkey. We're with you, bro. Okay. <laughs> And you get to do just that. So it gets blasted out to all the employees. And he has a great story about survey monkey. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Can't wait to hear it. Um, so my department does that. And, and when you, when I tested for sergeant, you go in, you know, with you, if you make it to the, to the chief interview, he sits down and he goes over those surveys with you. And if there's a common theme, you know, whether it's yeah, both negative and positive, obviously, right. but it comes to light and you do find out, you know, uh, what people really do think yeah. about you. Peer yeah. review, man, is, is, it's a powerful tool. Is. Yeah, power, uh, peer reviews, you yeah. know, and there's going to be one off. Somebody may not like you and they're going to sling mud at the wall and you know, whatever you can pick that out. But listen, when you have a common theme going, you, you may want to take a look at yourself in the mirror and yeah. you probably have that problem and, yep. and you probably should work on it. Um, is that something you guys do or? We did a survey when we first came <laughs> in, we did a survey monkey. <laughs> All right. And uh, it went horribly wrong. Oh, no, no. I'm just kidding. It, 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 you it know, hurt some feelings. It hurt some feelings. <laughs> oh, I bet. And we made it anonymous and, and everybody got on. Nobody trusted the anonymous part. <laughs> Nobody and does. Then, Nobody ever does. You know, so I think we probably what 85% that did it. Um, but to this day, one of our captains still talks about the survey. But the survey it doesn't told us, bother him. But oh yeah, yeah. The told he's the only us one still talking. Few guys, there was a few guys that, like you said, a bunch of people are like not a good leader. Blah 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 blah. blah. And they've since weeded themselves out. Um, so the survey was pretty on spot on. A couple of them have really tr used it and flipped it. Like yeah. Matt said, a couple of people have taken that and said, oh man, I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to change it. And they've become great leaders. So it was good and bad. I mean, ultimately you don't want to see the stuff about yourself. Either, no, of course not. You know, cause I, I included me in there too. And it's, you know, you don't want to ever want to see that, but honestly you need good feedback. How else are you going to get politics better? Politics keeps right, you yeah. humble too. Like I'm oh, in yeah. politics, mm -hmm. so politics, when you start thinking you're pretty great, go post something and <laughs> yeah. just start seeing real quick. People don't think you're that great. And that's yeah, one so. of the, one of the things when we were talking about social media and stuff, that was one of the things that I really had to, to tame myself on because, uh, you know, I've, I've grown to love this guy and, uh, I'd do anything for him. And, and so when, when they attack him, I'd be like, fuck these people, I want to fight. <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 settle down. Yeah. So I'm like the bulldog that he's pulling back. Yeah. And I'm like, no, nah, just let me go, man. I'll take him. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's funny. The second thing I wanted to touch on was kind of your background being in a more business world, you know, and then coming into law enforcement late and then running for sheriff and being very successful. And look, I'm not saying this is what we should do. I'm just throwing this out there. What you guys think, what if, you start to get more business minded people who are entrepreneurs and start investing them or bringing them into the law enforcement culture at maybe Lieutenant captain level, because like, you know, you said, you're not, you're not a cop anymore at that point. You right. are an administrator. You are really, you are a business person at that point. If we I mean, can afford to, to send more guys to not police business schools, but actual business schools, they would see this profession very different. Um, I, I said the three things that I brought to the table were, I did have law enforcement experience, albeit not as man, much as my opponent did when I ran in the first race, um, business skills, and then personal skills in the beginning, the most valuable was probably the business skills. I could have not been a cop and I still could have been successful because I surround myself with good career law enforcement guys. You could take a business guy, pop him in as a chief of police. I promise you that that agency, as long as he has a good number two, good number three, that agency will probably be far more successful than most agencies. Yeah, I They don't that. have to be uh, cops because you have people in place that know the police business. Exactly. You need somebody that can take the police take that mindset and bring a different mindset to it. Matt has become a pro at budgets. You know, these are things that you become like, we're running a business. We are responsible to the taxpayers. People work hard for that money. And we were, they were way out of whack when we first took over. We had to fix it all. And within the first two years, we were over budget. After that, we've been under budget ever since because we, we pay attention to that. We, all that stuff is business. And so there are skills that you just can't acquire in this profession. We've started to take our lieutenants and say, Hey, look, we want you guys to create your own budgets because we want you to get a feel for the business part. And that was a, a big part of uh, what I knew from being there 
because I, I was one of those guys that I always wanted more. I wanted more, more, more. I want to know more. I want to learn more. I want to be responsible for more. Give me more shit. Come on. And so I was always asking as a lieutenant, I never had my own budget. And I would constantly ask, can I have my own budget? Like I have a SWAT team. I have all these undercovers. I have this anti-smuggling squad that needs all this special equipment. Can I have my own budget? And they would always say, no, 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 that's our job. You know, you have no business looking at budgets and stuff like that. Um, and so they always shunned us away from that, which is a disadvantage for anybody trying to move up, right? Because you're not learning. And so when we took over, that's one of the things we flipped to is we said, no, you guys are actually going to learn about the budget and you're going to be responsible for your own budget. So we're going to start handing this stuff off because I can't run this whole thing by myself. I need you guys. And so we started teaching them from first, we brought in our, our main county finance and procurement and said, we're going to baby step this thing through. We want you to understand the global perspective, the county budget as a whole and why taxes matter and why our rating matters and why. So we brought them in to teach our command staff that stuff. And then we baby step forward into their own budgets and, and how the, the SO budget works and how it's allotted and all that stuff. And then stepped them forward into their specific budget for their area. And now we have like, we're going into budget season right now. Our lieutenants and above are all proposing their own budgets. And mm. here's what I need. Here's what my people need. Here's the equipment we need for our areas, which makes it so much simpler. A, they know they have insight into what's yeah. going on. They're invested in that. A, they have the experience. And we tell them, we told them from the beginning, I am working on my replacement as we speak. From day one, the, the day I took this chair as chief deputy, I am working on my replacement. So I'm training all of you so that we can figure out who's going to be this guy next. So that whether it's Sheriff Lamb or the next sheriff, they have somebody that they can plug into that position because we owe that to the county. We owe it to the agency. I've spent my whole life here. And one our, our mantra from the beginning, um, he brought in two things. Fear not, do right. And, and that was like decision-making stuff, right? Just do what's right. Don't yeah. fear all the bullshit. And then the other thing that, that we brought in is the, the thought process of leaving it better than we got it. No, no matter what it is, we want to leave it better than when we got it. And, and that was not the case up until then. They were, you know, previous administrations had not been that responsible. And so we said from the beginning, we want to have this place better than when we got it. And when we leave you in charge, we want you to make it better than when you got it. And we want to keep that going forward. Cause you know, if you're in martial arts or any of that stuff, um, like when I leave, whoever fills my seat, if they are more successful than me, then that's the ultimate yeah, this is again ultimate yeah, goal. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I think oh, sorry, go ahead, dude. I think that's one one of the interesting things about law enforcement is and you even said it, when pe it's really hard to get hired and then you have a small pool and then within law enforcement you stay in that same agency because if you promote up, it's very difficult to lateral to another agency. And then your focus is career of law enforcement and then the business aspect, you don't really gain that. And having that outside thought and different education is huge. And I see it where you know, there's, there's handfuls of management and people that are moving up that are really, really good. They're just not given those opportunities right. and you know that they need that. And that's one of the things that sounds like you guys are constantly doing. And this is another example of that is you're, you recognize that things don't work and you're reaching out and you're pulling in procurement and different people to teach and educate. So people leave when you leave they're better and they're prepared. And a lot of management that I've talked to and friends at other agencies, their upper management is threatened by the people below them yeah. and yeah. they keep them in those spots. Yeah. And they're like, you're really good there. You're going to stay there. Because they don't want to be exposed for not being good leaders. Yeah. yeah. To me, if a guy comes up and is a better leader than me, then I, I feel successful. Like I don't feel threatened by that. Why? Because I know I'm a good leader. I know I'm good. Am I the best? No. Am I trying to be the best that I can be every day? Yes. But I also get that there might be somebody better. There's always somebody bigger, tougher, stronger, faster yeah. than you are. Mm -hmm. And so our goal is to just try to be the best we can be, but I'm not threatened by anybody underneath me. If they surpass me, great. I love it. 
I and that mean, empowers them. Yes. Everyone gets better. But well, a lot and, of and that I is think threatening. Most of those people that are yeah. are that push people down are threatened because they don't want to be exposed for the fact that they're not the leader that they should be. Right. Yeah. Right. Agreed. And they and rather than rather than have the humility to say, like for for me, walking into this as a lieutenant, no budget experience. So I went from like my max budget experience was probably a million dollars over like my narcs and stuff. That's about the, the max capacity budget that I had experience with. I stepped from that literally from one day to the next, one million is my capacity to 50 million. So in one day's time, I'm responsible for a $50 million budget. We walked into a $3 million deficit. And so we have a $50 million budget with a $3 million deficit that we have to fix. And here you go, here's the keys to the city. And so we have to figure that out because the last guys, that's the other thing that we, we've we promised ourselves is no matter what we think of who takes these seats next, we're not going to torpedo them to try and make them unsuccessful. We're gonna set them up for success, whether it's differing views. Let's say a Democrat sheriff came in and won and we didn't like that, right? And and we didn't feel he was gonna do a good job. That still doesn't mean that we're gonna to torpedo them because that's what happened to us. They, they gave us a deficit, a crappy budget and said, here's the keys, good luck. And it's like, dude, why mm -hmm. would you do that to an agency you care for and people you care for and a county you care for? Um, so we are, not going down that road and not going with that model. We're going with the make it better than we got it, help the future leaders and whoever they are and try and just be better stewards of the money and the the resources that we're given as a, as a mm -hmm. government entity because we're responsible. And he says it all the time. I'm responsible to the people that hired me, which are the voters. People, yeah, I yeah. like it. That's all, awesome. all these young cops out there are listening to this going, God damn it. Why are we listening about budget stuff? Like, listen, you little young thundercats. We're giving your bosses <laughs> some really good Kyle. advice to make yeah. your job better. So, Dude. well, and I'll give you an example Seriously. of that for, for the young cops that are out there. Like, what are we talking about? I'll tell you why we're talking about budget because I was the SWAT cop kicking doors who couldn't get shit. I couldn't get the night vision I wanted. I couldn't get the weapons I wanted. I couldn't get any of that shit because it wasn't in the budget or I didn't plan it properly, yeah. blah, blah, blah. When I got the keys to the budget, guess what happened? SWAT dudes started getting the SWAT shit they needed. They yeah. started getting the equipment they needed. They started getting the resources they needed. And that was true for all of our units. Our guys hadn't gotten raises for 11 years. Wow. wow. Now they get raises almost every year. And you're, yeah. and you're, and you're Why? still because under budget. It's yeah. business. I've been in sales for a long time. I know what, how to build relationships of trust so that when it comes time to get my people what they deserve, I go to work. I start to do all the, the, the legwork of building those relationships, using, you know, the sales tactics to be able to get the things from the county that we need to get, but at the same time being cognizant to the taxpayer. And, and it's give and take too, learning the, like the sheriff's saying, learning the business side of it to where you understand when you're dealing, because when we're dealing with county government at the executive level, you're dealing with CFOs and CEOs essentially. And so understanding that, hey, it's not just about us because cops get caught in that trap too. Like yeah. we're the police, we we should get everything we mm -hmm. ask for. Yeah, but public works also needs the things they ask for and taxes, they need the things they ask for. And so it's give and take where you're meeting with that leadership and you're saying, we need 20 cars. And they're like, well, we need a bulldozer. And if you get 20 cars and we won't get a bulldozer, but if you get 15 cars, we can get a bulldozer. Cool. Then let's go with 15 cars so you can get your bulldozer. And then the next time around, they're like, you know what? You gave us our bulldozer last time. So let's give you five extra cars because you shorted yourself last time. And it's that kind of stuff. It's those business negotiations that go on in relationships. And they don't just affect the equipment. They affect when my guys go out and chase somebody um, and do the things, do the door kicking, do the uh, roughing people up, all that stuff. Everybody knows we're running a business here and we do it very proficiently and we do it in a manner that doesn't get sued. We haven't been challenged our merit. We have not been sued one time on any of the discipline we've given. Um, we, we have, but we've been, we haven't lost any of those mm -hmm. cases. And so all of that is business but it allows the cops out there, the guys that put on the badge, the door kickers, 
to do their job and they don't have to worry about all this level of it. Yeah. That's why I said that. I mean, I was joking about the young cops, but seriously, <laughs> this is like gold listening to this because as the young cop, they, they, they don't, you don't understand everything that we're right. talking about you right can. now. It's not your job. No, no but what a huge impact it makes on your job as the patrol guy or the SWAT guy or the canine guy or whatever it is that you do. Like this stuff right here is going to make your job that much better. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, again, another big thing that we push in our leadership um, that, that we push down throughout the leadership ranks is leading down, right? Because uh, the old days of, and, and it's different in emergencies. I get that. I, you know, I'm, I, even though I'm not really a cop, I, I still dress <laughs> up still like a cop. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I know how cops think because I've been one long enough. And, and so when it comes to emergencies and shit, I get it. Like it's, hey, you do this, you do this, no questions asked, let's go. I get that part. But when it comes to normal operations, we can't function that way. And that's what the police world is stuck in. Do it because I said do it. Well, that doesn't work, man, because I want to know the why behind what I'm doing. And I don't know. I don't want to know the why because I'm challenging your authority. I want to know the why so that I have an understanding because I'm trying to learn and I'm trying to absorb because I want to be you one day. And so I can only get there if I understand what it takes to mm. get there and, and understand why you're thinking what you're thinking, why you're giving the orders that you're giving. And so that's another thing that we push is like, give these people the explanations that they deserve because- mm. A, it's going to help them and B, it's going to give you buy-in and it's going to make everybody's life a lot easier and it's going to give them a different perspective that they don't normally get and, and it just helps the whole process. Yeah. Wow. I think this whole segment on leadership Leader, was- yeah. I mean, there's so great. many like, I mean, oh, look, dude, rabbit dude, it's real, all, the it's reality all intertwined. Is, yeah, like you, you could spend a week talking about leadership and really not even scratch the surface, but like these are all like super good nuggets for people. Oh yeah. I, look, I don't know how many chiefs or captains or I, I know there's some admin that, that listen to our show. They've reached out to us and uh, this is good information. I actually do a thing where I say I do leadership training and I say I have a slide that says it's your fault. So if you're not hiring, it's your fault. Yeah, that's true. If your yeah. budget's out of whack, it's your fault. It's not your troops fault. It's your fault. Yeah. So you got to figure out what it is that you got to fix. Hmm. Like what is it you need to adjust because ultimately you're the guy. If something's wrong in my agency, I don't get to go bitch to anybody. It's my fault. Mm -hmm. And I better get to fixing it and figuring it out. Now, do I have people that help me fix it? Yes. Yeah. But I think oftentimes leaders are like, oh, the market sucks. We can't hire anybody. BS. <laughs> yep. That's BS. I'm hiring. Other places are hiring. It's not easy, but it's still, you can still do it if you're out there hustling. Um, most cops will tell you, uh, look, I'll sit in a room full of chiefs and I'll be like, how many of you are having troubles hiring? They'll all raise their hand. Yeah. And I'll say, how many of you, when people ask you if you would be, if you're, you want your kids to be cops, tell them no. I said, stop. If you, you cannot bitch about people not wanting to come into this profession. If you are telling them not to go into this profession. <laughs> uh, that's pretty powerful. And I'm yeah. like, stop telling people wow. that. I yeah. was doing it. And finally I had to realize, you know what? No, this is a great profession. It's an honorable profession. We need warriors now more than ever. And so absolutely you should get into this. If you want a challenge and you want to have a great job that pays you a good consistent salary. I've been a businessman where you don't get a check every two weeks. Yeah. These kids that get did checks every two weeks, they, don't, they, they underestimate the value of that. Um, they get a retirement. They get all these things. It is still a phenomenal job. It, leaders got to stop telling people, oh, I would never tell anybody to do this job. Then yeah. stop bitching about being hiring, yeah. Yeah. you know, because you're part of the problem. Well, and, and one of the things we uh, we do, we have a graduation Thursday. We have a graduation. We have some detention officers graduating. And so we'll go over and uh, welcome them to the profession. And one of the things the sheriff has allowed me to do as a chief is I give them a chief's letter. And it basically welcomes them to the profession. And it, it kind of lines out for them. Welcome to the profession. Welcome to a huge family. Um, here's the expectations. We expect you to be a guardian of the position you're given. And we expect you to be a warrior when the time comes. Like this is a no bullshit job. And sometimes it calls for violence. And I had a, a, another great old guy told me one time, he said, son, we are in a customer service environment in policing. If the customer demand, demands violence, we got to give it to them and we got to give it to them quick and we got to give it to them hard and we got to give it to them fast because that's what wins fights. And that 
is what keeps you alive. And so we kind of tell our guys that and we give them this opening letter. Welcome to the profession. Here's our expectations. First, we expect you to be a guardian and a pillar of your community. And then we expect you to be able to get down and dirty when it's time to do that. And and we back you on that because we know. What else is in that letter? And the last thing is that we give them a pocket constitution and we tell them, this is your guiding principle. This is what we all swore an oath to. So we give them a pocket constitution to carry with them because we always want them, if they're, if they're ever a question in their head, they should pull that out. And that is their guiding document as to how they do their job. Nice. Constitution trumps policy every day of the week. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Wow. You guys uh, share like a powerful <coughs> message with people. I mean, you guys are, uh, I, I guess it is why, you, you know, the American sheriff, I mean, <laughs> dude, seriously, like you're, what you guys bring to the table is not something you see all the time in law enforcement. You guys have a different philosophy on this and it's really working. And I, I really like it. I, I it's like, I don't know, we need to get more people on board with your guys' style of, you know, philosophy. You know, you know what has to happen. And I, I did like the sheriff, you know, I speak sometimes and I tell guys, you have to be willing to lose your job when you take this job because there's going to be a time that you have to stand up against a huge crowd and tell them, I don't care what you think. This is what's right. And we're, we're saying that, no, this is right. And this is the stance. And COVID was a perfect example of that. We took some hits during COVID because of our stance, but I'll tell you what, and you can be wherever you want on this subject, but when it was all said and done, we were on the right side of history on that one because we stood for the right stuff. Somebody asked, said to me the other day, well, the chiefs can't say that. And I said, yes, they can. They may lose their job, but they can absolutely say it. Yeah, yeah it's true. And that's the difference. Like, I, look, there's no guarantees. Yeah, it's a little bit easier for me because I have a four-year term. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to get voted out when that term is up. You know, I could. So, but we've never, for us, it's never been about whether we stay in power or whatever for us, it's about doing what's right. And if it's good and by the people, then they'll vote you back in. If not, then you take your ball and go home. Yeah. And we're, we're both uh, guys of faith, right? We, we have a strong faith in God. And when we took these positions, that was one of our discussions that I didn't talk about is uh, I'm a big predetermined guy. I, I believe that my, my numbers already punched. I just don't know the date. And so it's coming eventually um, that my path has already been predetermined. I have a little bit of influence on that. I can be like the Israelites and roam for 40 years or I can go the way I'm supposed to go. And so when we got into these positions, that was one of the discussions we had is like, let's go with what's right. And a lot of times when we have a tough decision, we will, he'll, he'll say, you know what? Let's go home. Let's take the night, sleep on it, and let's come back tomorrow. And nine times, I'd say 10 times out of 10, when we come back, we're both like, yep, this is the way we're supposed to go. Mm. And we know it's the right way and it's worked out. And we've said, if, if we're not supposed to be in these positions anymore, that's because that's our path is going a different direction now. Wow. So I think by you guys putting yourselves out there, I mean, you guys are in the limelight in in the nation, you know, Um, you're not just the face you had mentioned, you're the face of the department. I'd say you're running on to be the face of the nation right now of the country and which is a good thing. And I, I guess what I would ask <laughs> yeah. that, <laughs> you look great. Yeah. We, look, he asked to do pa- the front of the camera. I look Listen. like twice the size of everybody <laughs> yeah, else. Yeah. yeah. We're like, no, we don't, we don't wear makeup in here. <laughs> you don't need the he powder. Asked if he could do makeup, if there was makeup before the yeah. show. And I'm like, no, we don't do that. We're just a couple yeah. of cops and wing it. No powder, <laughs> no, nothing. no powder, no, 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 I'm just teasing. He did offer us a massage parlor downstairs. <laughs> yeah. <He's, laughs> Kyle's never offered that to me, but he's like first thing to you guys. Guys, I know we're having some great conversation, but I want to maybe remind you we are sponsored by ice barrel yeah. if you like cold therapy you want to get in good shape get your health right make sure you go to ice barrel and it even helps restore your voice in some yeah, cases yeah. it even helps you become a man yeah. and <laughs> it, it check out make sure you enter the promo code sfp to get yourself a discount word icebarrel.com check it out icebarrel.com makes this show possible so, yes yeah. thank you, you so we much just, there's your promo <laughs> yeah nice work guys all, all right, right. Let's, so let's not bad for my first yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah yeah so let's talk about the media and how you handle critics and what you've done to really promote your agency with the media aspect and how that's, that's changed. That's a lot to it. Fuck. I wrote a whole chapter in my book about- You did. We'll get to uh, the yeah. books. We'll get to those the books. Those who matter don't matter and those who matter don't mind. Fuck the critics. Uh, Give us the watered down version. You're going to get critics, okay? If you're doing any, if you sit in the corner, some fat cat behind a desk and don't make, don't, don't create any ripples in the water, nobody's going to say anything. 
But if you're actually doing something, you're going to have critics. Um, Aristotle has a great quote that says, uh, the only way to avoid criticism is to do nothing, say nothing, or be nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, I refuse to not say anything. I refuse to not be anything. And I refuse to not do anything. And so um, you got to be willing to get out there and do it. What you realize, and we talked a little bit about this on the break, is we talked about how the people who are doing work better than you are never your critics. It's always people doing worse than you. And I, one thing I talked about in the book that helped me is, because it's hard. I get you get critics as a sheriff, but then you get critics on politics and in social media. And I mean, they just... We have a saying in our in our family, you want to know what you did wrong in life? Run for office, you'll find out. Whether you did <laughs> yeah. it or you didn't do it. Yeah. Um, I've been accused of things that I've, I've never done. I've tried to live a good life and I've been accused of things I haven't done. I've probably put myself in positions that didn't help that, but you know, you, you, you live and learn. Um, but what you have to remember, and, and it used to have a, if, if I read something negative, it bothered me for weeks. And what I realized was they were robbing my family of me. Huh. And once I realized I, uh, that I had control over that, not them, I just started shutting it out. And I realized it wasn't me. It was them that had a problem. I didn't have a problem. They had a problem. Whether it was they were unhappy with their life or they weren't uh, challenging themselves or whatever they were doing, they felt it necessary to tear down somebody who was doing something. And so once I realized that, I was able to kind of come to terms more with the, the critics. As far as the media, I owe the media nothing. They're not voters in my county most of the time. They are, and I, I owe um, an explanation to the people of my county, not the media. And so that's what I do. I go on social media. I don't do press conferences. If you want a statement, I put it out on social media and the media can go pick it up after there, after my community has already heard it. That's I like how that. we do it. I like it. I like it. It's unique. Yep. And uh, for me, that I'm the same model because I've been told pretty much my whole life what I can't be by people, right? People always tell you, you're not going to do this. You can't do that. And even when I took this position, I had critics, some internally, like, how are you going to be the chief deputy? You were only a lieutenant. You've never managed a budget. You've never managed an agency. You don't have a degree. And uh, I said, well, fucking hold my beer because you know, <laughs> that, that's kind of been my whole career when they tell me. I can't do something. I'm like, okay, so if you think I can't do it, not only am I going to do it, but I'm going to do it better than it's ever been done before. Just to show you fuckers yeah. that I control my destiny, not you. And, and like the sheriff said, it's usually people that are too afraid to go into risk and to go into danger that are sitting back talking about what everybody else is not doing while we're the ones doing it. So oh, yeah. Fuck we the use critics. something called brown rice. <laughs> That's what I use. I just ignore it. So there's a old movie called What the Bleep Do We Know? It was back in the early two thousands and it was fuck based on the quantum the bleep. physics. <laughs> and it was and the movie's actually called What the Bleep Do We Know? But um <laughs> It is, it, it talks about quantum physics, how God plays a role in quantum physics, all that stuff. But anyway, there's a Japanese guy who does the study on water and the effects that certain things have on water. And humans are comprised of what, 70, 80% water. Mm -hmm. So he really shows what effect water has on us too. So he does, he does an experiment with these three bowls of rice. He cooks the rice and he takes one of them and he puts on there, I love you, you're beautiful. And on the second one, he puts, I hate you, you're ugly. And on the third one, you put nothing. So every day for 30 days, you have your kids get up or you get up and you pick the first bowl up and say, I love you, you're beautiful. And you take the second bowl and you pick it up and you're like, I hate you, you're ugly. And then the third bowl, you don't touch for 30 days. You don't pick it up, you don't say anything to it. By the end of the 30 days, the first bowl will be a little bit moldy, but still white, you know, and moldy. The second bowl will be moldy and nasty. But by far, the worst bowl is the third bowl, the one that you paid no mind to. So we brown rice people, we let them chirp over here. You just don't pay them any mind. It actually frustrates them. They make mistakes. They do things. They get angry because they're not getting your attention. And in the end, it has no effect on you. Um, I choose to be positive. I choose to focus on what I'm doing and I brown rice everybody else that's a critic or a naysayer. I think it's good to listen to some of the stuff your critics say just because there are some things you can learn from it and just be like, you know what? I probably do need to 
make an adjustment here and, and be better in that category. But don't dwell on it because the fact that you're getting criticism means you're over the target. They don't sh shoot anti-aircraft bullets at ship uh, planes that aren't even close to the target. They shoot them on, on planes that are close to the target. So, mm -hmm. And a perfect example of him carrying that out in politics was uh, in his first run for sheriff. When they asked him, it it was a debate. I think um, your your opponent says this, your opponent says that, and he was like, "Oh, I have an opponent." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what the opponent pretty... says is all. <laughs> That's funny. Wow. Um, let's see here. So, I have a question. What is your next step in politics after your term is up in twenty twenty four? Would do you plan on running for office or? You know, a lot of people, uh, when I, I'm going to give you my answer, but a lot of people say, oh, I knew you were going to do that. I honestly had zero desire to move anywhere else. I think sheriff is one of the top positions in, in law enforcement. I actually met with a senator recently, and I'll tell you that story in a second. But the reason I met with the senator is because I'm actually considering running for U.S. Senate in the state of Arizona. I'm just tired of where politics are in our state. Um, what you see on a national level is not indicative of what's going on on the ground level in Arizona. Our party, the Republican Party in Arizona, is fractured and set and divided. And so we've got to bring it back together. And I looked at the landscape of the, the candidates that were out there, people that we thought could win, and, and I just couldn't see anybody out there. And I'm not one of those guys that waits for somebody else to get out the truck and go do it and deal with the bad guy. I'm the guy that's supposed to do that. So I was said, you know what? Screw it. I'm willing to do it. I also, Matt and I talked about it, you know, he and I are both kind of the same mindset where we get these stages and we, we feel like we need to push to another level. I'm in a position where I need a quantum leap. I need to push to another level. We've, we've done a lot at the agency and we, we could still do a lot more, but I also feel like this might be that time where I have to jump, you know, and then I lost my son and my granddaughter and my soon to be daughter-in-law in December in a tragic car accident, coming, kind of put me off the rails for a few weeks, maybe a month. But then when I came back, I realized that life is no guarantees. There is no guarantee of tomorrow. Um, and all you take with you is what you've done in life. Mm -hmm. You know, and what's your, there's a movie called The Peanut Butter Falcon, if you haven't watched it, with Shia <laughs> no. LaBeouf. And then he's got a kid that's got Down syndrome following him around. And they're getting ready to swim across this water. And he's like, am I going to die? And he says, yeah, yeah, you're going to die. <laughs> the question is whether you got any good, everybody's going to die. Sooner or later, the question is whether you got good stories to tell when you do, yeah. you know? And so, uh, you know, I want good stories to tell. Anyway, I'll, I'll tell you this one quick little quip. I went to meet with a senator and he says, you know, why are you considering running for Senate? And I said, I really don't want to. I got the greatest job. I'm the sheriff. I said, let me tell you a story of a senator down in Louisiana. One day he gets a phone call to his office and it's this little old lady, Miss Devro, And she says, ah, the Senator grew up on my street and I need to talk to him. So the secretary comes in, Hey, Senator, Miss Devro calls, says she, she knew you since you were a little boy. So he picks up the phone, calls her, Hey, Miss Devro. She's like, Oh, it's good to hear from you, but I'm gonna cut right to the chase. I got a new neighbor and that new neighbor's got a dog and that dog keeps chasing my cat. Well, that dog chased my cat up into the tree today. And now my cat won't come down. And he says, well, have you thought about calling the sheriff? She says, it's a cat in the tree. I didn't think I had to go all the way up to the sheriff to get this. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> yeah. That's how I feel. The sheriff is the best position, but, yeah. um, you know, our state needs something and um, I'm willing to step up. And in the end, if it's meant to be, it'll be. If not, you know, then uh, I'll, I'll probably jump into the private sector. But that's the next step for me. And, um, you know, we've been... It's a hard decision because I love being at the sheriff's office. I love what we've done. I love the employees and I feel a sense of uh, commitment and devotion to them. So that's, that was the hardest thing for me to kind of make that decision. Yeah, I bet. Nice. Well, talk a little bit about your guys' books here. What, uh, where can people find them? A little bit about them and uh, yeah. So I wrote this book a few years ago. It's American Sheriff Traditional Values in a Modern World. I just think we've lost value, lost contact with traditional values of toughness and and overcoming difficulties that life is not all, you know, 
roses and, and, and sunshine, you know, life will punch you in the face over and over again. And so a lot of those things I talk about in this book and a lot of personal experiences, kind of a background on my life intertwined with traditional values. And then I wanted to write a second book called, uh, American Sheriff Rules to Live By. I'm somewhat of a Renaissance man. I like to read. I like, uh, I like the classics and, um, there's a poem by Rudyard Kipling, If, uh, it's a great poem. And so this book is based on that poem and the different stanzas of the poem. I tell stories of the different founding fathers, the sac- stories of sacrifice, of courage, of determination, things that we need as Americans now. So it's American Sheriff Rules to Live By. You can get these at americansheriff.store, americansheriff.store. You can get them on Amazon too, but uh, why well, give some money to the big guy, you know? <laughs> give some, uh, if you come to me, I actually sign them and send them out myself. Um, just my wife and I doing this and my wife has a couple books as well. And I know, um, when I wrote these books, I think everybody has a book in them. Everybody's got a story to tell. And, um, and I told Matt, I was like, Hey, you got an awesome story to tell. Like with the things Matt's done in law enforcement, especially relates to the border, which is a hot topic right now. I was like, you should really consider writing the book. And, you know, to his credit, he did. Yep. So, uh, for mine, it was, uh, it was a labor of love kind of, um, I knew from the stories that I had told the sheriff about some of the stuff we did that were counter cartel operations, um, and some of the, some of the undercover stuff we did and some of the unique, uh, just stories, uh, as we went through them. Cause when you, you guys know how it is, any cop out there knows how it is when you're doing the cop work, you're just like, whatever, this is the work we're doing. It's what's mm-hmm. in front of us. We're dealing with it. Um, but then when you start talking to other cops about the stuff you've done compared to what they've done, because a lot of it is normal, right? When we get into the SWAT world, a barricade is a barricade, HRTs are HRTs, search warrants are search warrants, some of them more extraordinary than others. Uh, but for this particular work that we were doing, there were no other law enforcement agencies in the nation doing the type of work we were doing as local law enforcement, right? And so we were out doing counter cartel operations on U.S. soil where the cartel really hold operational control of those areas. And it was the remote desert areas of our county. And so we had done all these crazy operations and a lot of it we were learning on the fly because it wasn't law enforcement. It was more military type operations. Mm -hmm. Um, So as I told him some of these stories and I just told other people some of the stories are, you know, you get that, dude, you should, you should write a book. And you're always like, write a book. Who the hell is going to read this? (laughs) And, uh, um, you know, through our discussions, I was like, huh, all right, maybe I should. And then, and one of the big driving factors was like, man, a lot of good people did a lot of good work and put in a lot of hours fighting these bastards. And I really want to memorialize all the stuff that goes on behind this big camouflage curtain that the normal public doesn't see. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the nights we spend away from families and the work that we're doing that nobody knows about that's keeping the country safe, them safe, their community safe. So I got a bunch of those operations together and then uh, it's on the Mexican cartels, it's on the Mexican culture. And so I knew like, okay, I'm a white guy. So I kind of have to qualify why I'm, I'm talking about the Mexican culture and how I know about it. So I start the book off with how I grew up because I grew up in a rough area of Phoenix. It's, it's the South side of Phoenix. It was a, a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood gangs, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then as I got into my teens, uh, we moved out to a farming area, predominantly Hispanic. I worked in the fields next to the migrants in the summertime. Um, we would do summertime jobs out there. And so I was working with the migrants still, you know, kind of immersed in that culture and uh, married to a Mexican wife. Uh, her family is, is uh, they actually came over illegally initially and then got their citizenship later on in the 80s. Um, and, and the area they're from is heavy with cartel activity and they've been extorted, they've been robbed, they've been killed. And she has family members that have died at the hand of some of the cartels. And so I start off with kind of who I am, a little bit about me and why I know what I know about what I'm talking about. And then I go into the cultures of the, the Mexican cartel themselves and how they've kind of hijacked. Uh, they have their own narco subculture within the Mexican culture, some of their religious beliefs as we've seen them, uh, their structure, how, how we see their structure, and then how they operated in our county. And then I go into the operations themselves and, and kind of take it from, from there. And yeah, that's it, man. Wow. Awesome. Well, well, you guys got us copies and I can't wait to read them. 
Yeah. Yeah. So mine's like C spot run. <laughs> so if you can, if you like hey, that that's my pace. Reading, you're, then you're good yeah. to go. And mine my, has pictures because I'm yeah. a guy. Yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> a little bit of coloring book there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but hopefully people will go check them out. I mean, look, we, yeah. we do oh, yeah, these yeah. because we yeah. want to share our stories, but at the same time, you know, it's uh, a labor of love and it's, you know, yeah. Hopefully you'll come support us at it. Yeah. Uh, oh, and, so. and, and for mine, uh, um, I have my own website as well. It's one time nation.com. Uh, my, my handle on Instagram is deputy one time. And so I took the one time and, and uh, one time nation.com and same thing. They can order the book and I sign them for them and send them out to them or they can find it on Amazon, Apple books, all that stuff. That's really cool. And the sheriff and the chief have agreed to, if you guys drop a comment in this video and the sheriff disclaimer said, it's gotta be a good comment. Yeah. Good comment. It's gotta be a good, cool comment. Uh, you Can guys be like, I hate those guys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're not, you ain't getting a free book, yeah. but uh, no drop critics. a comment and you guys enter a free chance to win a signed book, uh, by these guys. And we will uh, deliver that to you. So appreciate you guys uh, via mail doing that. most likely. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. We're not coming to your door and dropping it yeah, off. Yeah. Via mail. <laughs> They were gracious enough to donate a couple books. They've signed them and we will get them to you. So drop a comment and enter a chance to win the books. Yep. Gentlemen, uh, we peeled back a lot of layers of this onion, uh, particularly about leadership and policing and organizations and stuff. And it has been phenomenal. I learned a ton listening to you guys. Um, thank you very much for taking the time out of your guys' day, taking the time from your families, <coughs> your organization to come here speak with us to our listeners and fans that watch the show. I mean, I, I seriously, I, I can't thank you guys enough. You guys have been awesome. fantastic. It's been awesome. You guys have been great hosts. Yeah. And we appreciate you guys and what you do, your service to your communities. And thank you to all you cops out there for, we do this because we love this profession. We love you guys. We yeah. love uh, everybody who puts on the badge every Absolutely. day, the feds even. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of them's watching. Damn it. Yeah. We love yeah. all of it. And we love all the, the civilians out there that support us as well. That yeah. I mean, Honestly, we couldn't do this job without that support. So- uh, and, and just want to say thank you guys and be safe out there. And uh, all the, the cops out there listening, no matter, you know, feds, local, state, whatever, keep the faith, man. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we we got to stay in the fight. Don't be discouraged. Don't listen to the media. They're, they're pushing a narrative that's not true. And I can tell you as a leader, and we talk to leaders all over the country of law enforcement agencies, the, the narrative of the public doesn't like us is bullshit. Mm -hmm. Um, the public loves us. And those of you who are working the street, the patrol officers know this because you're dealing with it every day. So keep the faith. Don't listen to the hype. Do what you know is right and just keep pushing forward because we need you. Fear not, do right. Oh yep. yeah. Well, thank you guys for being here. It's it's an honor for us to have you here. We know how busy you are. So we really actually want to thank your county for sharing you and, and for everything that you know for sharing for everyone for all of our listeners i know i've learned a ton of stuff and i'm going to take it to heart and i have growth myself and i know a lot of people have learned a lot i wish you the best of luck in everything from here on out thank you so much i can't wait to read your books and you guys are amazing so thank you so much yeah. all right guys thanks for supporting the show again comment like and share it with a friend if you guys got value out of it subscribe to our channel helps us grow to be able to bring guests like this into the studio to give you guys good content We're trying to make everybody safe you know do do a good job and um, with that said we'll see you guys on the next show and uh, take care keep moving forward